Welcome to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? A weekly video podcast features creatives, writers, and readers when we come together to talk about books. I am your host, Karen E. Osborne, author of four novels and counting. I am so glad you're here. I think you're going to enjoy our next guest. Hello, hello. I am so glad that you have returned, or if this is your first time, welcome, welcome. I want you to meet my guest today, Suzanne. And I hope I pronounced this correctly, Suzanne. I should have asked you. Montaboni? Mataboni, yeah. Mataboni. <laughs> All right. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She is an award winning fiction writer. I mean, award winning <laughs> fiction, writer, fiction writer. She's a poet and an essayist. She's a PR professional, a Newsweek expert forum contributor, and a former reporter for Newsday. She writes women's fiction and horror. We have to talk about that. <laughs> and her novel, yes. Once in a Lifetime, which is a coming of age women's fiction set in the 80s, and we're going to talk about that as well, is the winner of the Pencraft Award, an Ippy Independent Publishers Award, a London Book Festival Award, and an International Book Award. Wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so before we dive into your novel and talk a lot about your novel, Tell us a little bit about your writing journey. And I'm really interested in how you moved from nonfiction to fiction, or was those always parallel? Tell us about that. Uh, well, let's see. I, I'm one of those people, and I noticed in your info, you said that you've always been a writer since you could remember. Uh, I'm kind of the same way. I, I've always been telling stories, whether it was you know, sitting and pretending to be like interviewing people. And, you know, when I was like a five-year-old in my <laughs> in my bedroom, we're going to be like a, a talk show host or creating dialogues with my toys, you know, and, and coming up with, you know, all, so all complicated stories for them. So I have notebooks that go back to like second grade um, in my basement. And <laughs> I've always been writing something or other, some songs or uh, um, uh, stories and that kind of thing. And I think originally, maybe in my head, I was a fiction writer. I was writing, I was writing stories and dialogues for people. Mm -hmm. uh, I did end up doing a certain amount of journalism because it was a way to get clips out there uh, and put together, you know, a resume and get jobs out in the marketplace that would pay a little bit better than just saying, "Hey, I'm a fiction writer by my story," because you know we all know it's not. <laughs> lucrative a market out there <laughs> it has to be its own reward <laughs> yes yes exactly so uh and that's also why i'm a public relations director because in looking for ways to use those talents that you know where people had a budget to pay you uh i started going into like corporate pr um now eventually i did come back to fiction and having been in corporate PR, I have a little bit more of a budget now for <laughs> to be a fiction writer and to, you know, do my own marketing and such. So it's kind of worked out as long as you can be patient enough and realize mm -hmm. that you can't do it all at the same time. You can do it all, but not maybe at the same time. And yeah, you know, yeah. that's sort of one of the themes in the in the book that we'll maybe we'll talk well, about. That is. All right. Well, let's talk about that. So share the the setting. For, it's called Once in a Lifetime. And please like share the setting and the premise of it and give us give us a little bit about the book. Uh, well, the, the setting is a lot of fun. It's set in the 1980s, the mid 1980s, uh, kind of against the backdrop of new wave music and pop culture, art and, you know, Andy Warhol and uh, um, those kind of very vibrant um uh, art and and creative you know, electronic music and uh, all that going on uh, during this time period. So what we have is a young college art student by the name of Jessica, who is very ambitious, wants to be this multimedia superstar <laughs> type sensation and be you know uh, um, famous and uh, uh, rich and famous and and artistically you know well regarded. Let's say. 
Uh, and she can't wait to get her life started. And she's kind of frustrated being in college because she feels like all these exciting things in the world of music and art are happening without her. <laughs> and she wants to get out there out of her little bubble. Uh, so her and her artsy roommate, uh, avant-garde friends, uh, decide to spend a summer uh, waitressing to raise money so that she can have uh, uh, enough tuition money to go ahead to this uh, terrific mosaic arts program that she wants to enroll in in London, which is also where all the cool new wave slash post-punk things are going on in uh, 1984. Uh, so she's uh, very ambitious, wants by, you know, blank or high water to get into this program that she can't afford. Uh, and with her friends kind of goes through all these trials and tribulations, uh, waitressing in kind of an artsy, crazy town and meeting a lot of uh, interesting characters and getting into kind of a love triangle type thing with her uh, ex-boyfriend who had kind of said, well, if you're gonna go have these adventures, go have them and we'll have to put this on hold. And a new boyfriend who turns out to be a new wave guitar player from a band that she goes to see in, in the Philadelphia area. So, you know, some exciting things going on. <laughs> yeah, now where does where does she live? Where does the story take place? Uh, well, the town that they go to Waitressen where, where all the action takes place is uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania, uh, mm. which is across the river from New Jersey. Um, actually, the, the original title of the book was Excuse Me, Waitress, Is That New Jersey? Which, <laughs> you know, usually made people laugh, but it was a little long for the, you know, a book cover. So, <laughs> but it is a very uh, artsy town full of galleries and restaurants and theater folk and, um, you know, people of all persuasions and such. And was an enclave in the 80s that was far more progressive at the time than say the rest of the country, more along the lines of like a San Francisco at the time. Uh, at the time. So yeah. yes, yes. So it was an education. It's what it's what Jessica called life as it is. I want to get out there and meet people and see the world and meet and experience life as it is. And whatever is out there and whoever, you know, people may be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what do you love about Jessica? You know, we, we have to, before you, you can love our characters, we have to love them. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you love about her? Well, I love that she is quite the go-getter. I love that she is really devoted to her vision of creativity, of feeling that there's huge value in looking at the world and kind of reconfiguring things the way that you want it to be and expressing that somehow, whether that's through music or through uh, charcoal or through her mosaics or where, whatever other medium uh, you decide to work in. And she feels like that's how her brain works with everything at, at all times, that she's kind of like reassembling the world to her liking and as much as she can, she will reproduce it in different ways to mm. show it to the rest of the world, show everybody else what's going on in her head. <laughs> Is there any part of you in Jessica? Uh, well, a lot of the characters that I write about, even in different uh, areas of fiction, um, like my short stories and such, they will start with people that I know or with something about me but then they kind of run off and they go, and I'm sure, I'm sure you experience these kind of things, right? They, take they run off and do things that, yeah, <laughs> that they didn't expect. And it, you know, becomes fiction and they fit into an arc and you craft them and they change. Uh, so there is a lot of my early experiences in Jessica, but she kind of runs off and does her own, th own thing. And so do many of the characters in the, <laughs> in the book. Yeah, yeah. Like they want to do. So you mentioned um, art and music, and and that's like this. It's it's all in the book, right? It's it's a huge part of the uh, the book. Tell us just a little bit about that. Why, in the sense of, because you told us that it's there, but why was that so important to you? Why why did you want to capture that in the book? Well, capturing it is is key. It's interesting that you use that phrase because I say that a lot. Um, at the time. The whole new wave music movement was going on and kind of peaking where it was very um, kind of 
U.S. slash European, um, almost you know global in certain ways, depending on uh, you know what songs you were you were picking up. Um, there were a lot of things going on with music that really hadn't happened before. Instruments that you had never heard, uh, influences from all over the place, like you know reggae and ska and uh, and punk and things sort of like boiling together. Uh, and it was very exciting for young people because this is what we related to. And it kind of distinguished a lot of things for you and kind of like you made your choices on what friends you had, what clothes you yeah. wore, what clubs you went to based on what music you listened to. So if yeah. you were part of this scene, it was very kind of exclusive. This is mine. I own it. And we knew something really cool was happening. You know, I mean, maybe uh, looking back, like I said, on part of those experiences that I drew from of, of mine, we thought it would just last forever, <laughs> which it did not. <laughs> but in hindsight, it makes it, I think, that much more special. This moment in time when people were out trolling, you know, record graveyard stores for, uh, you know, a special EP from Germany, you know, that that nobody else could find. And it was you were special if you were able to dig those things up, if you had heard of these certain bands that were all kind of underground, et cetera, and went to these certain clubs that, you know, sometimes got kind of rough, <laughs> but yeah, it was a challenge. Yeah. I, you know, you're, you're sending me back. My, our daughter is, um, so she was born in the early seventies. And so by the time she, the eighties were here, you know, she was maturing and, and music was everything. And she didn't want, we have anything to do with any music that they played <laughs> on the top 40 you know it had to, she was in her doing she was into hardcore and mm. it was and, and it was european and it was very male dominated and it was it was her life it was she and her girlfriends they just they followed their bands around and they got in a mm -hmm. lot of trouble and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of depends. Some some bands were scarier than others, but <laughs> oh my god. It well, got a lot, she was you know, later, and, but... her, and her parents were not happy with this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I totally this is cool. I bet she'd like this book. Um yeah, so I would hope without, so. Yeah. Um giving too much away. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier um that you know, characters take take us to all kinds of places, right? They they change, they become somebody else that we didn't even think that they were gonna happen. Can you share just a little bit without ruining the story for anybody? If the answer is no, that's fine, about how Jessica grows. Uh let's see. I'll try to be a, a little vague, but there there's you know certain analogies in the book that she uses as she realizes the things that she's learning from this experience and that is um she realizes that her ambition as much as it's a credit to her sometimes is the thing that leads her to bump heads with boyfriends with with employers with you know her own anything that she's trying to to establish she's ambitious to the point where she kind of feels like she's going to alienate any relationship that she could possibly mm. establish. Um, and as a mosaic artist, she kind of, uh, it, she wants to, what she calls trans transmogrify everybody in her creative brain and make them into what she thinks they should be or what she's assuming that they're going to be. And that's not the way life works. And, so I think in her growth, she kind of realizes that she has to be able to accept people for who they are, not just yeah. who she wants them to be. And this mm. is maybe more of a, a relationship type of uh, credo. Because mm -hmm. um, I think we're more accepting of our friends' personalities and flaws and things than we are of our, you know, love, romantic love partners. <laughs> yes, yes, that's so true. That is so true. That's very wise. So are you working on something else? Uh, I had mentioned I have been writing a lot of short stories and I thought it was, I thought it was funny. You're very intuitive with these things because you also said, oh, women's fiction and horror. We should talk about that. 
because I am trying to kind of resolve <laughs> those two things <laughs> in my life and in my my writing. And it's, it's kind of like, okay, relationships and gore. All right, what do we do with that? <laughs> but the thing is, I love writing women's fiction, but it's not, and it's, some of it is fun fiction, but a lot of it is kind of like dark, dysfunctional relationships that don't work and people are kind of all broken and damaged. Um, and there's not a lot of market for that in the short fiction you know say genre there's really yeah. there's just very little and after a while after banging my head against the wall trying to find places to send these stories to I said all right well you know what maybe I should just give in and start writing genre fiction and thought to myself okay so what genre do I want to be in went back to kind of my roots as a teenager when I was a huge Stephen King fan and said mm. all right I'm gonna write horror stories now yeah. <laughs> So, so now where this leads me is that now I have these kind of dark, weird relationship stories. Um, I have, uh, you know, a certain amount of stories about family because I do have them very close to my uh, uh, kind of long extended family units. Uh, and then these gory stories about people, you know, getting into like coming to very bad physical harm. <laughs> I've put those together into a collection of kind of like just running with gore, lust, and kin and giving it three parts. And here you go. Here's the horror. Here's the mm. broken relationships. Here's the families. And everybody is really trying to get from wherever they are in life to some other place that they know they're supposed to be and they just don't know how to get there. So, wow. so, so that's what I'm working on now. Yeah. And we'll see. I'm going to give it a little time. And I've sent it to some places for uh, some contests, let's say, for collections. But I have to be patient and waiting for all those deadlines to elapse to see what happens. Yeah, so. that sounds exciting, though, especially you know, with the different genres, but the, but that unifying thread uh, mm -hmm. of everyone trying to get to the place where they will they'll be happy. Well, yeah, that's that seems to be what. I write about is just someone is just so unsettled and is sort of seeing their next life and where they need to go, but are just so confused as to how to get there. I don't know how to get there. <laughs> and isn't that life? Isn't that, I mean, yeah, right. That that's, that's so uh, relatable. That's so that sounds really, really cool. So as you think about um, all of your writing, your horror, your women's fiction, your family stuff, all of it, is there any books or writers back, you know, back earlier that kind of influenced? You mentioned Stephen King. Were there yeah. other authors or books that really had a profound effect on your on your craft? Well, you know, I might I might not have had a real good answer other than Stephen King, but uh, I'm working with another podcaster who does like a uh, they're we're calling it now the Gen X Book Club. Uh, so he does a lot of '80s nostalgia. And we've been reading books from the 80s. I read Bright Lights, Big City for that. And as I'm rereading it, I'm noticing how much that influenced my early writing. Because I'm almost, and I didn't realize that at the time, but I felt like I was kind of almost emulating that very detached style and writing about mm. people and all their, you know, damaging uh, um, uh, habits and tendencies that are, you know, dragging them down into the abyss. But uh, so I have to say, in looking back, Jay, maybe Jay McInerney and uh, Brett Easton Ellis from the 80s did really influence my writing. Um, wow. I also loved really irreverent writers like Tom Robbins. Uh, and now yeah. I don't know that I've emulated his writing, but I've loved his sensibility and wish that I could put more, infuse more of that into what I'm writing. Uh, I don't know if it's quite the style, you know, I don't know if it's quite my marketable style right now, so. I've almost had to beg off on that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we do learn from what we read, no matter what. Absolutely, right? We mm. we learn so much from what we read. So, have you read something recently that you could recommend to our audience? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. and wait, down. wait, Suzanne. Before you do that, we have not seen your book cover. Ah, well, see. it's in the background here, but here I got a close up yes, for you. But the, the, they, let's put yeah. it up. Once in a lifetime, this is, I'm trying to get, yeah, that's because oh, we got yeah. Blair. Look at that. But, that's very um, this nice. This is a, a, the second edition. So this is a new cover. Mm. Uh, and the second edition has one of my short stories in it. 
It also has a, a, a foreword by Annie Zaleski, who is a rock journalist who works with Rolling Stone and she's done stuff for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and wrote, I don't know if you can see it in the background, but there's a um, uh, Duran Duran, uh, Rio, Rio's hot right now because they just found the model who did, who was the, you know, the original source material. But in any case, she's, she's written about rock journalists from like Madonna to Lady Gaga to the Duran Duran. So I'm very happy to have her involved. So yeah, yeah. that that's the cover. It's, it's that's exciting. It's kind of yes. Yeah. <laughs> so then I interrupted you. You were going to tell us about something you read recently that oh. you could recommend. Okay. Just so let me just. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing this is giving it correctly. Okay. Like what I've been doing is trying to buy a lot of popular women's fiction and read it and say, okay, so this is what's marketable now. This is what people kind of uh, suggest that you do. And I don't love all of them, but a couple of them I, I, I think live up to the hype. There was one recently that I read that is called uh, Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine. Yes. <laughs> and it was not only a very unique character, but mm. at every moment, very true to herself and the characteristics that they give in this character, which um, seems to, I mean, they don't specifically say what's going on, but um, she, she seems to be somewhere on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and has had some great trauma in her youth. And since you wrote, you seem to recognize the title, um, you know, uh, maybe you're familiar, but yes, in any yes. case, I thought it was very effectively done and maybe difficult to, uh, to be able to express a, a, a point of view from a, a character who is not your typical, you know, snarky young girl. She's living a whole different experience than a lot of uh, other people yeah, who are now. Yeah, it was a really good book. It was a great read. I agree. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it very much. So now that you've totally intrigued our audience and and they're interested in you and they're <laughs> interested in your books and uh, they want to follow you how can they how can they follow you how can they be in touch okay well uh i'm out there at uh suzannemataboni.com um and uh there is a separate page for the novel once in a lifetime novel.com uh mm. i am on facebook suzanne greco mataboni uh, you know, I had been publishing as a, uh, a young person before I was married, so I kind of held on to that. But once again, too big to fit on a book cover. <laughs> I'm on Twitter at, I think, Suze Mataboni 80s. And similarly, TikTok, I think, Suzanne Mataboni book. But I don't think there's too many Suzanne Matabonis to get me confused with. So, <laughs> yeah. and the book's I'm on Amazon and, and just it's new on Kindle Unlimited, so... Yay. <laughs> excellent. 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 Yeah. Unlike my name where there are other Karen Osborns that are out there writing. So I had to get my E in there. Karen E. Okay. Osborne. Yeah. That works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. This has been so much fun. It's just been a delight meeting you. And I hope all of you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have enjoyed it. I hope that you will follow Suzanne, you will get on, you'll look at her on TikTok and on Facebook, and you will buy her book, you'll write it, you'll write a review. Reviews are so important to us. I hope when you do <laughs> reach out to her, you let her know you met her, and what are you reading? What are you writing? See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.